Welcome to LDR 655, Negotiation as Process. We're using Essentials of Negotiation by Roy Lewicki, David Saunders, and Bruce Berry from McGraw-Hill, published in 2011, edition 5E. I'm John Wallace, as we're meeting online the first week of class. I produce videos for the presentations to help assist you in your learning. I don't think that my schedule will allow me time to produce videos for the sessions where we're actually meeting in class in our blended format. Negotiation, of course, is something we do to varying degrees every day, or maybe more importantly, we're not aware that we're in a negotiation. We just acquiesce to requests from leaders, followers, family, and others without actually entering into a negotiation. The importance of this class comes in part from understanding the terms, certainly in understanding the negotiation process, but most importantly from recognizing situations and opportunities for negotiation and your ability then to understand your opponents, pardon the term, Viewpoint. Negotiations involve the sharing or dividing of limited resources. Creation of something new out of the two. Collaboration is key. Involved heavily in mergers and acquisitions, many of which do not go well. Dispute resolution, and of course in customer service for all of our organizations. Most people think bargaining and negotiation mean the same thing. However, we will be distinctive about the way we use these two words because they are not the same thing. Bargaining describes a competitive win-lose situation. Negotiation refers to a win-win situation, or as I will say beyond the textbook, a win-win-win situation, such as those that occur when parties try to find a mutually acceptable solution to a complex conflict. And given the need for value creation in our organizations today, the win-win-win situations where not only do both parties gain something of value, but the other stakeholders not directly involved in the negotiations, gain something as well. The definition of negotiation and the basic characteristics of negotiation situations are in negotiations both parties need each other, which is the definition of interdependence, the relationship between people and groups that most often leads them to negotiate, and understanding the dynamics of conflict and conflict management processes, which serve as a backdrop for different ways that people approach and manage negotiations. This area in particular is highly important, and some research shows that managers spend up to 40% of their time handling conflict within the organization. The basic characteristics of negotiation are that there are two or more parties. We'll discuss in later chapters multiple party negotiations. There is a conflict of needs and desires between two or more entities. Parties negotiate because they think they can get a better deal than by simply accepting what the other side offers. And parties expect, or should expect, a give-and-take process. Now, that depends somewhat on the psychological motivation beliefs of those coming to the table, as it were, because, face it, we've all been in discussions, not necessarily official organizational negotiations, where the other side wasn't going to budge no matter what. Parties search for agreement rather than fighting openly, arguing, capitulating or giving up, surrendering, breaking off contact permanently, discontinuing contact taking their dispute to a third party, hired or not, where they may lose some control over the outcome. And successful negotiation involves management of both the tangibles, the price or the terms of an agreement, and resolution of intangibles, the underlying psychological motivations involved, such as winning, losing, saving face. Psychological motivations are highly important. You've heard me say in class before, life boils down to psychology, philosophy, and math. Not necessarily in that order. In negotiation, parties need to achieve their preferred outcomes or objectives. This mutual dependency is called interdependence. Interdependent goals are an important aspect of negotiation. Win-lose, I win, you lose, doesn't often go very well. Win-win, opportunities for both parties to gain. And as we must stress beyond the textbook, the win-win-win scenario where other stakeholders, customers, vendors, etc., can also gain from the value creation of the negotiation. Interdependent parties are characterized by interlocking goals. In our nice little graph here, you've got A's and B's. Having interdependent goals does not mean that everyone wants or needs exactly the same thing, which actually would be rather boring. Convergence is a movement unto itself these days with many descriptions, but a simple definition is the coming together of different viewpoints or entities that leads to direction towards each other and the same place, point, or results. Let me say that again and maybe slightly rephrase. Two different entities, organizations, people, however it may be, that come together and reach a third point, 
along the way that benefits both. A mixture of convergent and conflicting goals characterizes most independent relationships. Mutual adjustment, the outcomes that we're looking for in interdependence levels and situation structure, guides both the negotiation process and the outcomes. Mutual adjustment throughout negotiations occurs through both interdependent levels, the structure used that impact the processes and eventual outcomes. When you hear the term zero-sum or zero-sum gain, which originated in the 1950s and comes from both game and economic theory, and like the term bargaining leads to one winner or distributive outcomes where resources meet one side's needs, they don't meet the other. Non-zero-sum or integrative outcomes derive from economics as well. Many economic situations are not zero-sum since valuable goods and services can be created, destroyed, or badly allocated in a number of ways, and any of these will create a net gain or loss of utility to numerous stakeholders. Specifically, all trade is by definition a positive sum because when two parties agree to an exchange, each party must consider the goods it is receiving to be more valuable than the goods it is delivering. In fact, all economic exchange must benefit both parties to the point that each party can overcome its transaction cost or the transaction simply wouldn't take place. Evaluating interdependence depends heavily on the alternatives to working together. The desirability to work together is better for outcomes, and you will certainly need to know and understand the term BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, B-A-T-N-A. Mutual adjustment should continue throughout the negotiation as both parties act to influence the other. Thus, the cycle you see here of share, observe, listen, understand, and adjust. That's also why you have an assignment this week of researching body language to increase your power of observation and understanding by what you observe in the parties around you. One of the key causes of the changes that occur during a negotiation is mutual influence, the primary change force. The effective negotiator needs to understand how people will adjust and readjust and how the negotiations might twist and turn based on one's own moves and the other's responses, kind of like chess or any other competitive event. The term locus of control was first introduced in the 1950s by psychologist Julian Rotter. People with an internal locus of control believe that they are primarily responsible for the outcomes in their lives and they are focused on themselves. Those with an external locus of control believe that forces outside of themselves affect their ability to succeed and they're paying attention to those outside forces. Very few of us live entirely internally or externally, but if our mindset is external, we are more aware of what's occurring around us and thus are able to make better continual adjustments. Concession making occurs when one party agrees to make a change in their position. A concession has been made within the range of bargains that is acceptable to that party, and we'll discuss range of bargains coming up. There's always a range. Concessions restrict the range of options because you've just narrowed it down, and when a concession is made, the bargaining range is further constrained. Whether we're talking about negotiations among family, coworkers, or multiple organizations, the difficulties of honesty and trust are paramount. Within your graduate studies of leadership, you should be well aware of this on many levels. The dilemma of honesty is concerned about how much truth to tell the other party. You can't give everything away at the very beginning or you've just given up the negotiation. And the dilemma of trust is concerned about how much should negotiators believe what the other party tells them. The value claiming and creation are opportunities to win or share resources, and they happen continually. Claiming value is the result of zero-sum or distributive situations where the object is to gain the largest piece of the resource at the expense of the other party. Creating value, on the other hand, results in non-zero-sum or integrative situations where the object is to have both parties do well. Most actual negotiations are a combination of claiming and creating value processes. Negotiators must be able to recognize situations that require more of one approach than the other. Negotiators must be versatile in their comfort and use of both major strategic approaches. Negotiator perceptions of situations tend to be biased towards seeing problems as more distributive, competitive than they really are. And understanding your own biases is paramount to your being a successful negotiator. As the Delphi Temple proclaimed, self-knowledge is the beginning of wisdom. Value differences exist between almost all of us and certainly between negotiators. There are differences in the interests involved in judgments or visions of the future. Difference in risk tolerance, both the individual and the organization is willing to take, they vary greatly. 
Differences in time preferences, whether these constraints are individual or passed on from higher up in the organization. Are there deadlines we must meet? Conflict is somewhat continual. We'd all like to live in peace, but that's not quite how business or the world works. Conflict may be defined as a sharp disagreement or opposition and includes the perceived divergence of interest or a belief that the party's current aspirations cannot be achieved simultaneously. Now, there are intrapersonal or intrapsychic conflict, and that occurs within an individual. Say, for instance, we want an ice cream cone at the end of the semester, but we know that ice cream is very fattening, bad for our heart and our hips, and we don't need it. Interpersonal conflict is between different individuals or different organizations. Conflict between bosses and followers, spouses, siblings, roommates, whoever it may be. Intragroup conflict is within a group, among team and committee members, within families and classes. Intergroup conflict can occur between organizations, warring nations, feuding families, the Hatfields and the McCoys, as it were, or within splintered, fragmented communities. These negotiations are the most complex to work through. There are a number of dysfunctions that will disrupt negotiations. Having competitive win-lose goals, where you win at all costs and the opponent loses or vice versa. Misperception and bias. Emotionality. Because you have to be somewhat detached going into this, regardless of how strongly you feel about the negotiation or the objectives. Decreasing communication. Negotiation is a highly communicative process. Blurred issues. Issues that are not clarified and clear. Rigid commitments that don't allow flexibility and collaboration. Magnifying differences rather than magnifying similarities. If we minimize the similarities, we will have difficulty. And escalation of conflict. There comes a point where you may just have to withdraw for a time and cool off. The functions and benefits of negotiation are organizational members become more engaged with increased coping skills, mostly through discussion and communication. Effective negotiation promises organizational adaptation and change, improves relationships and heightens morale, promotes self-awareness and empathy, understanding for others, enhances personal development. It builds psychological development and improving self-analysis. And it can be stimulating and fun. Understanding the dual concerns model is of great importance to effective conflict management and negotiation. You're going to see it in later chapters as well. It suggests that independent parties have two different concerns, self and others. Vertically would be our level of cooperation, and horizontally is the level of the assertive dimension, self. In the middle is where compromise leads to those win-win-win outcomes. And just for variation, out of Emerald Insight, from an article by M.A. Rahim, here's another variation of the graph, just to give you a different way of looking at it. You can download the PDF and copy the picture if you'd like. There are several actions and activities involved within conflict management. On one end, we have contending, where actors pursue their own outcomes strongly, show little concern for the other party, obtaining their desired outcomes, and collaboration is likely not to happen. Yielding, we show little interest in whether we get our own outcomes, but we're quite interested in whether the other party attains their outcomes, which is where we get walked on. In action, the actors show little interest in whether they attain their own outcomes and don't care about the other party either, and so nothing gets done and everybody walks away unhappy. Problem solving is where actors show high concern in obtaining their own outcomes as well as high concern for the other party obtaining their outcomes, which leads to compromising. Actors show moderate concern in obtaining their own outcomes as well as moderate concern for the other party obtaining their outcomes. If we're concerned about either the other party or ourselves to a high extreme level, we're not going to be able to compromise, collaborate, to gain an effective solution that gives the value added, the win-win-win for everybody. So if you think about it for a little bit, what are your patterns? Whether it's at work or with family or are you used to giving in too early and getting walked on in some cases? Are you too aggressive and causing difficulty for others because you're never willing to give in and sacrifice it all. You might take a few moments to think about that. You can also journal about it if you'd like. Your assignments for week one are, well, you just finished watching the video, so that's kind of covered. Read chapter one. You want to research body language, find us a good article that's been published or a good website for it, and then post it in the discussion thread and talk about it. You're going to journal and you take the chapter one quiz. We're not too much work, but enough work that you're still going to be able to grow and add this into your toolbox when you're done. So, 
time to get to work. Have a great week. And uh, if you have any questions or needs at any time, contact me. You know I respond within 24 hours always and often much quicker than that. Have a great day.